In order to achieve an erection, you have to be in a very relaxed parasympathetic state. The queen of men's health. Oh, I get rock solid boners every day. My test must be fine. Why don't you get your labs done first? Today, we have Allie Gilbert. I find men very easy to deal with. I find women can be a little more complicated. A lot of guys that like to prove me wrong, like my wife loves my balls. I'm like, <laughs> I've seen women prescribe 50 milligrams from Florida clinics and I'm just like, why? Primo is considered the most mild steroid for men and women. It is very difficult to shift gears if you have a naked chick walk by and they're like, nah, let's go. <laughs> I've had guys who are 200 pounds and they're coming in at 140 grams. I'm like, all right, we can do better than this. If you don't mind me asking though, how'd you get started with health and fitness for men? I don't know if this is going to be offensive or not. Test, test, trend, yeah. Deca. <laughs> sounds good. All right, cool. Yeah, sounds perfect. Just gonna make sure I don't smack my fucking candy again this time. So everybody doesn't hate me. I brought it for a reason. It's okay. <laughs> I won't take offense. Allie knew that I love the new nerds gummy clusters, so she brought me a pack. I'm thoughtful. I'm a woman. So I'm gonna be eating it the entire podcast because <laughs> I'm a professional. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that you're like really open about talking about all these things too, including like. Yeah. I'm an open book. I, I will literally, you can ask me anything. Mm -hmm. Like. Everybody loves the anabolics. They always do. Anyways, <laughs> guys, today we have Allie Gilbert, the queen of men's health. Uh, she helps men optimize testosterone, whether on their natural, whether on their natural, whether they're natural <laughs> or TRT. Um, I read the nerds. Get jacked, lean, and healthy, and also normalizes bone talk. I do. <laughs> the boner talk is super interesting to me. That's something I feel like I'm very intrigued to hear about because. I've had some boner issues in the past as well. Have so, you really? For sure. For sure. But I mean, then again, you know, I, I jumped on PEDs at some point. So that yeah. definitely helped complicate things. I have it in my email signature as well. Just so people know. Normalizing boner talk. Normalizing boner yeah. talk. <laughs> I love that. I'm like, I don't know if this is going to be offensive or not, but I kind of don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you don't mind me asking, though, how did you get started with, you know, TRT, hormone optimization, uh, health and fitness for men? Just how did you get like started with this whole shebang? And if you don't mind me asking why for men? Yeah, it's a weird pathway, right? Um, so I graduated, graduated with a degree in exercise science and I was like, I'm going to work strength and conditioning for the NFL because I don't know why I didn't really know much about football. Um, and the, when I graduated, I realized that the market for athletes was actually really saturated and a lot of athletes are broke unless you're at like the super elite level. So I was working in a commercial gym as a personal trainer and I started training a lot of guys that played golf. I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is a very wealthy town. I always preface it like I grew up normal, single mom, parent household. Um, but that town had a lot of guys that played golf, a lot of the Wall Street guys, because we were a half hour out of New York City. And there was nine golf clubs in Greenwich. So I was training all these guys that played golf and I'm like, I don't know anything about golf. I played soccer in college. I was like, I'm going to learn about this. And I learned that there was a golf fitness certification. And I was like, oh, this is a sport. And you have guys that can afford to train and they take it seriously. And I was just drawn to the very type A competitive personality being an athlete myself that it was just a very easy match. And I was a tomboy, played a lot of sports. So I went into the golf fitness certification through the Titleist Performance Institute and I trained all golfers and became the golf fitness person. And that brought me all men. And soon the conversation would shift from, well, I want to hit the ball farther to how do I get abs? Mm -hmm. How do I fill up my shirt? You know, I, I, they wanted to look better. And I was like, this is interesting because they don't usually bring this stuff up. And so, of course, like that, the golfers. How, I'm sorry. The golfers. Yeah. Yeah. They usually are like dead on. Like I need to play better. I want more mobility, blah, blah, blah. It always turned into like a nutrition talk. Wow. And that naturally progressed to hormones because symptoms of being tired and low energy and mm -hmm. all of that. I was like, you know, I'm very direct. And I was like, do you have any sexual performance issues? Like, you know, cause those are tied in and then they would just open up. And I think they felt very comfortable talking to me about this stuff. And so I was like, well, this is my responsibility to learn as much as I could. And when you're a young coach, you learn to niche and specialize in something. So I had an interest in hormones anyway, as 
science and learning about myself. So I started learning as much about testosterone and men's health and everything as I could and went to medical conferences. I even spoke at a medical conference. Like it, it was a fantastic experience. And in 2012, I had partnered with a doctor, Stephen Murphy, and we started selling blood work, which this was before you could buy blood work online, before all the online companies, like telemedicine wasn't really a thing. And we were selling specialized blood work that was out of network. So you couldn't buy it through insurance. And that opened my eyes to true optimization because you're taking healthy people who want to be able to perform at their best, who will do anything and everything to get there. And so we offered advanced like hormone testing and um, different genetic tests and urine tests and like literally anything that you can test that's like a bodily substance, we offered it. And then when online um, blood work was starting to be sold, then we divested the company because it was no longer necessary and we were not at that level of a lot of the online places. And I continued to just start learning more and more and more about testosterone and TRT and became known as like the chick that talks about testosterone because <laughs> they're like, no chick helps men. There's so many male coaches that specialize in women's Women, hormones. Exactly. Yeah. So many. But there's the opposite is like, it was very few and far between. At least I was the only person back then. And still now there's still, you know, people getting into that, but mm -hmm. there weren't really any women specializing in men's health. I think I can understand that. Cause like from the perspective of like what we are, uh, like the polarities of masculine and feminine, you know, technically masculine supportive, the tribe, you know, um, and uh, in kind of embodied leaders. Whereas I think it's just, uh, yeah, it's a lot more shocking to see the, the position of a, of a female or a woman that's supporting and helping men with their things, right? And I don't know how this is for all men. Like, honestly, just like you mentioned earlier, like the motherly figure, I think is yeah. is a really amazing angle. And I think, honestly, I love that about what you do. But I can also understand how in like certain, certain males that that can be a little bit of a trigger. Yeah. And, and you know, the joke about daddy issues, like I know there's a mommy issue joke. And that's actually sometimes the reason that I give how I got into men's mm -hmm. health is daddy issues. But um, it's more because I grew up with a compromised relationship with my dad that I want men to be able to show up as the best possible version of themselves for their kids, for their partner, for anyone around them. But you're right. I think a lot of them feel comfortable because I do have that empathetic side. And I, I have tons of conversations with younger guys in my DMs who are struggling with erectile dysfunction or, you know, just life in general. They're anxious. They're depressed. They don't know mm -hmm. why because, you know, I'm 42. So 10, 15 years ago, guys in their 20s didn't have these issues. And now a lot more of them are showing up with lower test levels and social anxiety and, you know, before phones and screens took over our life. Like my first cell phone, I was 17 years old. We didn't really have texting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you had to ask people like, hey, do you have texting? And you literally had to press the key five times to spell out a, a word yeah. on a flip phone. So that's how, you know, far back where you were forced to actually talk to people in person. And I think even past COVID where, you know, staying inside and not socializing really, really kind of confuse people as to how to act in person. So a lot of guys don't know how to talk to women or they don't have the confidence to really go out and make friends. They want to play video games instead and never go out in the world. And then they end up with all these issues that affect their boner and they think it's just testosterone related when you and I both know that there's actually tons of different reasons guys can struggle with that. Yep. And I feel like my heart goes out to them because I don't want anybody ever to feel such low self-confidence that it causes this depression and it just makes them isolate themselves. Mm -hmm. I want them to get the help. I want them, want them to get the right help, not from something shady that they're ordering online, but maybe this is a true medical intervention. Mm -hmm. Or if not, maybe it's just, hey, you need to get in shape. You need to eat higher quality food. Nerds are part of that. Um, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying is that it could just be like an atmosphere type of thing. Your environment is so crucial in molding you as a person. I spent a lot of time around men growing up in the industry, which I think has helped 
arm me with the ability to speak to them. I find men very easy to deal with. Mm-hmm. I find women can be a little more complicated. I think at one point it was easier for me to speak with the women. So I can understand from like a male's, uh, a male coach perspective. Um, I think I would have been able to engage with women easily that way, but um, that shifted. So I think I have, uh, I think I've, I don't know how, but I've definitely grown in my com- communication to a point where it seems about equal with both genders, which I'm really happy about. But in regards to men and their boners, um, <laughs> something that I always think about constantly. I, I don't think many men really want to talk about this, obviously, because as men, we're supposed to be able to do everything. We're supposed to be decisive. We're supposed to be able to um, to uh, satisfy our woman, to stimulate our woman, to bring her out to all the amazing, beautiful dates and events and everything together, you know, continuously stimulate the relationship with radical novelty, which is something that is easily lost in every relationship, right? If you don't have this, the, the mindfulness every day of acting in a relationship with radical novelty, it loses that stimulation, which also thus tends to lead to a loss in sexual stimulation. So, um, (laughs) which is kind of like why, like if, you know, you're talking to like the younger audience, like a Gen Z audience, and you guys are in a bunch of like situationships or like fair relationships <laughs> and shit. Like, you know, that shit's always going to be like giving you tons of drama, but also a lot of passion because you have radical novelty everywhere. You know, and like maybe you're talking to this person, you're talking to this person, but every time you like you find out like she's talking to somebody else, it makes you want her more or something like that. And it's just it's a constant like toxic cycle. But when it comes to like being in a relationship. I find that a lot of men have trouble talking about this because I'm sure I'm sure other people have had these occurrences. But like when you're in the bed with somebody, especially if it's someone that you really care about or maybe like your partner and then you just you can't get hard. Feelings like, well, fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? It, it 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 does suck because it, it can be so demoralizing. Mm-hmm. And um, I also tell them to you know, if, if the, the woman that they're with thinks it's her, reassure them it's not because that's pretty much automatic. A lot, a lot of women will be like, oh my God, do I look fat? Do I look this? Is it me? Is he not attracted to me? And the guy obviously can be mindful of that and that's going through his head. But also if he loses his erection or if he's been losing it or just doesn't get as hard as it used to, then he's just like, what's wrong with me? And that's what I hear a lot from younger guys. And they're like, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I tell them, listen, even though this may not be normal, it's actually very common. And the analogy that I use for the fitness industry is for understanding the impact stress has on your boner. Like if you were sitting here doing work and you were like dialed in, focused, like you had all the caffeine, everything, like you need to get something done. It is very difficult to shift gears. If you have a naked chick walk by and they're like, no, let's go. (laughs) You're like, "Uh, uh, uh," like, you know, crazy. Yeah. And it's the same as if like you're, you know, doing a, a one RM max squat and you're coming out of the hole and you're literally like bulging eyes, turning purple, about to shit your pants, like a lot of stress. And if a chick walked by and was like, come on, let's go. Like, fuck, trying to shift gears and pop a boner during that is massively impossible. And and if you can do it, then I mean, shit, more uh, credit to you. But the body reacts that way because it's perceiving stress. It doesn't know that you're trying to max out a one rep squat. It just is like, oh my gosh, I have to keep this person alive. So stress impacts the body in a similar way. Mm -hmm. So if you're constantly stressed out, if you're always worrying, if you always have deadlines, if if work is all on your mind or whatever. You're stressed out about your boner. Exactly. And you're stressed out about about your boner. Your body's going to be like, I'm just going to try to keep this person alive. Procreation's not my priority right now. And in order to achieve an erection, you have to be in a very relaxed parasympathetic state. Mm -hmm. So rest and digest. So when you're relaxed, it's a lot easier because your body's not perceiving stress. Ejaculation is sympathetic. That has to be absolutely like, yeah, fight or flight. Mm -hmm. But so many people are sympathetically driven, stressed out all day. How many people do you know that are just like super like, hey, yeah, 
I'm chilled out. Yeah, not everybody. Um, just like I was talking about earlier, I did my Prometheus uh, results mm-hmm. by putting my 23andMe raw data into Prometheus. Um, discovered a lot of really interesting things. And one of them was apparently I have, I don't remember what it's called specifically, but um, I have like the predisposition to be like, like chill. It's like most MMA fighters tend to have this more where it's like, Interesting. It re- they like don't have as much dopamine regularly on a regular level, but like it requires them more to like get running, but they're a lot more relaxed about situations. I think that so. might be COMT. I don't know. Yeah. And of course, somebody's going to be like, no, she's wrong. <laughs> just take it again. It's in our notes somewhere. We can just Google it. So yeah. It doesn't matter. But um, what I was thinking about earlier, uh, I think it's really cool that, you know, the women, women really empathize with each other and they always be like, oh, it's okay. Like if you feel like you're PMSing or whatever, this is normal, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. It's great that they're all talking about these things. But for men, uh, it's harder for us to be, like empathetic with each other and say it's okay. Yeah. Um, I think us just talking about it is going to help a lot. I do think like at least some awareness out there for like how we can um, prevent these things from happening is, but it is kind of unfortunate that for the women's side, for a lot of women out there, unless like maybe you're in the spiritual space, a lot of women aren't like, it's okay. I understand if you right. don't have a boner, like it's not a big deal. Like there are some, you know, there yeah. are some, but a lot of the times there's not. And um, one of the stories I can think of is one of my friends uh, experienced this. And I also heard Aubrey Marcus talk about this on this podcast too. But he was saying like, there was one night where there's this girl that he was seeing like, I think, I don't know if it was, I don't remember what the timeline was, but he was seeing this girl that he really cared about. And he really wanted to make sure that he like, that he satisfied her. That was like one of his top priorities. Mm -hmm. But every time that he either couldn't satisfy her or, he couldn't get hard, she would just be like, just turn around <sighs> and then fucking masturbate by yourself uh, <laughs> every single time. <laughs> and that shit, obviously, just continuously, constantly demoralizing. And I think it's just a downward spiral because, you know, as that keeps happening, like he's going to be constantly more stressed about his boner, of course, and that only makes things worse. And that psychological, like you can forgive, but you can't forget. And that's just going to run with him throughout yeah. the rest of life until there's some period of time where either like, I guess he heals from it or he figures out a way to, I don't know if it's whether related to his hormones or his psyche and his stress levels figures out how to fix his boner real quick guys. So while I was looking at the YouTube analytics, I actually saw that 85% of you guys that watch this channel are not subscribed. And I want to ask very little of you guys, but if you enjoy this podcast, if you find value in it, then please, do me this one favor and subscribe to the channel because doing so helps me get bigger and greater guests like the guests you are listening to today. Also, this channel is not sponsored, which means only the companies that I work with, which are Young Elaine Huge Supplements, are the companies that can help fund this channel by you guys using the code Nile. So Code Nile gives you a discount of 15% off of Young LA, and Code Nile also gives you a, f- a discount of 10% off of Huge Supplements. And if you decide to purchase anything from any of these companies, it will help immensely for me by using my code. And this way, I can travel to other guests, such as Dr. Mike Israel next week, and also upgrade an equipment to make this podcast bigger and better for you guys. At that age, like usually the younger guys, it's more like stress related. Um, Mm -hmm. in older guys, it can be more likely hormone or blood flow restriction and something like that. But you're right. Like when guys get together with their boys, they're not like, dude, I couldn't get her off last night. I lost my erection. Like, you're not going to hear that. But when women suffer hormone issues, like we will complain about it openly and socially and support each other and offer solutions. But men, they internalize because it looks weak. Mm -hmm. and they don't want to be vulnerable or admit that. But I do actually have some clients that I've talked about this with friends and with other people that they've said, listen, you need to get coaching on this. And they've been so appreciative of it because if one guy is talking about it, you know that there's at least four others that are thinking, shit, that's me. And this is rampant among younger guys, especially if they do have a high stress job and you know, maybe they're not in the best shape or 
the situation you just described, now that's all they're going to think about. And then they're, they're going to get performance anxiety from it. And it's almost going to make the situation worse because they're worried about what she's going to think or she's going to leave or anything like that. Whereas a female, you can really offer help through asking what's going on in his life right now that's bothering him, obviously, aside from what the situation that happened. And then maybe think of activities and things that can help decrease stress for him. That can be game changing. Mm -hmm. And it might be a hormonal issue because guys do have lower and lower testosterone levels, especially if they played with SARMs or PEDs early on in their life. And then they went off or they didn't do PCT properly. That can definitely mess with their ability to produce testosterone. But testosterone is not everything when it comes to erections. But most guys think that, well, oh, I get so, like rock solid boners every day. My test must be fine. Actually, you could have very low testosterone and there are guys who do get boners still, but so does the opposite happen where they think, you know, I have no testosterone. I must never get a boner. It'll affect it, but it's not the only thing. And I want guys to really understand that because either they'll think, well, if I can't please this woman properly, I need to jump on TRT why don't you get your labs done first? Why don't we see what else is going on in your life? Why don't we see what you're eating? Why don't we see how your lifestyle is? Are you even sleeping? Are you drinking alcohol? Like all those things come into play. It's just too easy to think about. Mm-hmm. I'm going to dismiss that because that can't be it. It's got to mm-hmm. be my testosterone. So it, it is a multifactorial thing when it comes to erections and even more complicated. And I have brought this up in other podcasts that people were like, you know, that's actually a really good point. If a guy is married, then it's different. If he's been with somebody for a very long time, like you were talking about with that novelty, that can play a part into it. Or if they have a girlfriend on the side and they can get an erection for her, but not the wife, obviously it's not an erectile dysfunction problem. So there's a stress and an anxiety that is caused when they're with the wife versus the girlfriend. Yeah. Or if they watch a lot of porn. So if somebody grew up just watching porn and that's what their idea of sex is and then they go and they get into a sexual relationship and they're like, well, this is totally not what I thought. There's a lot of hair. There's a lot of this. There's like, there's you know, oh my God, what's going on? Like, you know, <laughs> what's missionary? Like, I don't understand. And they expect all these antics and this like, you know, and a giant load and like all this stuff that guys expect. <laughs> it's so crazy. Like total side tangent, but like, one of the biggest things that guys complain about when they go on testosterone is that their load, <coughs> load size decreases. Mm-hmm. And and they're always like, well, how can I get a bigger load? My wife loves it. I'm like, she doesn't love it. You love it. You know, that's more of a, a dude thing. Or uh, with the testicles shrinking, because a lot of guys think that that's going to make them less of a man. And I tell them, listen, everything else looks bigger. Women don't really tell. There are, women don't really care. Uh, no one put on their Tinder profile as a female, I'm a ball girl. Please have a big sack. <laughs> no, like, this is, yeah, this is true. Girls don't really pay attention to your balls that <laughs> no. much. Like it, not, it's like, not it, it's much. not, I've never, I can't recall any man that I dated where I'm like, Oh, he had such big balls. It was great. Like, <laughs> like dude, that would be great. You know, I was the best tea bag ever. Like that's the not best just tea bag. <laughs> that's just not something that's in our daily <laughs> vocabulary. going to ask the next partner if she's down for that. You should <sighs> the teabag because there are like a lot of guys that like to prove me wrong. Like my wife loves my balls. I'm like, okay, cool. But it's like, you could make an exception for anything on social media. Like sure. Okay, great. If you love balls, awesome. The more power to her, let her do whatever she wants. Like, that's great. If you can get them in one hand, you know, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> functional. <laughs> They're fu- very functional. Yeah. Um, man, there's sorry. A that of- was a tangent. No, I loved it. Please <laughs> more. Uh, I'm just trying to backtrack to what I was thinking of. <laughs> I threw you off there. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe I'll remember the other stuff, but uh, it is kind of crazy though. It's freaking crazy that I think uh, a lot of us and I didn't even realize just how many people actually have jumped on a SARM or a PD and not PCT and still come off. Um, and I thought like everybody had like at least some kind of awareness that this was important, you know? If you're going to jump on, you either stay on TRT or you PCT in a healthy way, like you should. But there's a lot of people that don't, and I'm not really sure why. But um, like I had a friend that I found out recently, I'm not going to say his name, but um, I found out recently like he was told like 
you know, if you're going to be on TRT, then you're fine. You don't need to worry about it. But then he decided at some point he just didn't want to do it anymore. And he just stopped the TRT cold turkey. Oh, and he's been he's been in a very unmotivated, nearly depressed state for a year. And he was wondering why. And he came up to me and said, like, hey, I think I want to, like, start another cycle. And I'm like, I was, like, curious about how he's been feeling. He told me that. And then he also told me about the, the about... I, I went to him and I was like, so like how long ago did you come off um, like TRT? And he was like, honestly, I think it was like about a year ago. And I'm like, you started feeling like maybe like this depressive state where you just didn't care about certain things and you felt like tired all the time about, he's like a year ago. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> I almost promise you there's a very, very, very likely chance that this is because of that. Like a very likely chance. Yeah, I think, I, well also, I do want to preface this with TRT is not a cycle, right? A lot of guys think, you know, how long should he, I cycle TRT? Right. It's not right. He did run a cycle though, but then he went on TRT and then he stopped TRT. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause one thing guys struggle with, which I actually didn't realize until I started really getting into this is one of the bigger questions is, well, is this for life? And I'm like, yeah what's the problem? Like I didn't get it. And a lot of guys struggle with relying on something for the rest of their life. And they didn't want to be reliant on that. And I would explain to them, I've never had a client who's gone on testosterone replacement and then been like, you know what? This is not for me. I don't feel good. Mm -hmm. it, if managed properly, then it is something that can be life changing. If it's something that they're trying to do by themselves or they go on a super physiological cycle and then come off and don't post cycle therapy, then that can cause issues. But a lot of them struggled with it. And I said, if you're taking a life-saving medication, like a blood pressure medication or a heart medication or something that you cannot miss a dose for the rest of your life, you take supplements every day, pretty much for the rest of your life. That's okay. Then they reframe it and they're like, I understand. And I'm like, listen, now, if you come off, it's not like you drop dead and something happens. Like, you're just really not going to feel that great. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of them are like, well, it suppresses my own production. And I'm like, correct. However, your own production was not at a level that allowed you to live a high quality life. Yep. So then they, they get it and then they realize, okay. But to go back to your point about doing a post-cycle therapy, I think guys see the instant gratification from what may come from that versus the long-term consequences. And it's just the, the miseducation or just the ignorance to it, because there's a lot of information out there on how to do this properly more than ever, more than like 10 years ago. I mean, there's so many intelligent people on YouTube talking about this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's just maybe they don't know and then they jump on because they're very quick to make gains or, you know, hit the gym harder and then they just completely dump it and then they feel like your friend did and they don't realize that the long-term implications are going to cause them to either get on testosterone replacement earlier than they may have needed, which again is not a bad thing, but you kind of want to delay it as long as you can naturally to the point where you've really kind of exhausted everything that you've done naturally with diet, exercise, lifestyle, all that stuff, but also supplementally sleep. Again, there's so many people that are very overweight that live a shitty lifestyle and they're like, Oh, I just need to jump on a cycle and that's going to fix all my problems. Mm -hmm. I can just sit on the couch, inject things, and then I'll turn into Nile overnight and be absolutely shredded. And we know it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Well, I'd like to discuss how we can actually fix people's problems, um, which I know is not always easy because yeah. it varies per person. But I was thinking I would like to just share my experiences personally. This is actually something I've never talked about, but I've never really talked that much about boners and sex <laughs> on my podcast anyways. Um, so something that I think the two things that I think have helped me the most personally when it comes to boners and just being more empowered in the sex room. The first thing is I've like really settled in and, and like meditated on the perspective of just kind of like giving way less of a fuck in a way where like if I am in a situation where I can't get hard, whether it's because um, maybe maybe something happened with our relationship where I started feeling a little anxious or subconscious or a little bit in my head about like what's going on between us, um, whether or not maybe we were out and I 
took some kind of substance or something, um, like smoke some weed or something, my dopamine decreased, my prolactin increased. Now I can't get hard. That happens with me with weed a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also happened with me with ketamine. Ketamine just like numbs my dick so that it just doesn't <laughs> happen. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, a variety of other factors, right? There's a lot of different factors. Uh, I literally, I've set my head to this space where if I can't get hard, then I can't get hard. And I have like spent enough time like learning how to please my partners in other ways where in a way where I've found it like at least enjoyable if I can give them some kind of stimulation. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'll simply just stick to that and it'll be okay and it'll be fine. Um, And it'll just, in her perspective, if she, if this is her first time or second time having sex or whatever, she'll be wondering like, what would have it been like if he was hard? So maybe they'd still be curious. And then the other side is sometimes if I'm with my partner and like they decide to like sleep over or something in the morning, I'm like way more horny and I get hard. So <laughs> then normally the morning solves the issue for me. But I do notice that too. Is uh, yeah. It's a lot harder for me to, to get hard and be as sexually aroused at nighttime than it is in the morning. A lot of guys. Yeah. A lot of guys. Do you think it's morning. mostly just related to dopamine and rest? I think so. Yes. And also like testosterone peaks in the morning too. So that can play into it. But like, when you wake up, it's like you, you really weren't plagued with like negative thoughts or anxious things or fires to put out throughout the day. And it's, there's, no, there's no load of stress on you. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of people are pretty tired mm. um, and you have whatever you dealt with throughout that day to think about. Whereas in the morning, it's kind of like a clean slate. So I, I commend you for sharing that because a lot of guys go through that, but they don't openly talk about it. And it's something that more people than you realize do confront. And I think the idea of pleasing your partner in other ways is huge because I think one of the worst things that can happen if the guy can't get hard and loses his erection, he just kind of dismisses it, shuts down and then doesn't want to engage. And you're kind of leaving the woman as to like what the fuck just happened. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you can take care of her, she feels taken care of. Yeah. You know, and like, like, okay. There's a level of gratefulness that comes from seeing your effort, I think. Mm-hmm. And like the girl that turned away when when Aubrey like couldn't get hard and she just started masturbating. I think if your partner was actually sexually interested in you, they would probably appreciate, honestly, like you masturbating them versus them doing it themselves. Oh, yeah. So. 100%. I would be like, you know, okay, cool. He's not leaving me hanging. Yeah. Because that's one of the more disappointing things I would say. Like, I think most women have probably encountered at least one guy that maybe he was anxious or couldn't get up or whatever, had been drinking, drugs, whatever it is, you know, and it's kind of like, well, nothing for me. Whereas if you're quick to just, uh, rectify the situation and then take care of her. And then maybe the next morning things change, obviously. And obviously depends on, you know, your relationship with this person. So if it's Mm -hmm. a one night stand, I don't really think it matters. But again, if it's somebody that you're with more than once or whatever, you know, you gotta read the room. But I think like to what you said, if you take care of the woman, like, yeah, we're like, all right, you know, Mm -hmm. he didn't forget me before interested. Yeah. Uh, before I go to the second thing that's helped me, if you don't mind me asking, do you think there's a difference between like the stress levels that you have at night versus like the scientific stress that the cortisol that increases in the morning to like get you out of bed? Is there a difference in, in the sense of like, um, I guess, I guess I'm just making assumptions, but I feel like the psychological stress at night and you know, you being tired is obviously going to affect your sexual drive. Whereas in the morning, um, you're right. Your mind is a lot more clear. Uh, you wake up fresh most mm-hmm. of the time, especially if you had good sleep, yeah. hopefully. Um, I guess I'm just uh, I'm just thinking of how cortisol is highest in the morning and how that might relate at all to this situation. It, it does kind of get you jumped out, jumped out of bed and, you know, ready. Um, I think a lot of people live with like dysregulation because of circadian rhythms being all fucked up due to not getting enough sunlight and maybe, you know, being on screens all day and Mm -hmm. everything. I don't think it makes as much of a difference as many would say. Now, Mm -hmm. if you lived a very easy life in the sense that maybe you slept outside and you woke up to the natural sunlight every day and then you didn't have stimulants, which I can never imagine a life without stimulants yeah. and, and didn't have stress, then yes, maybe you would have like, a, you know, perfect blood work. But I mean, I think everybody at the end of the day has some shit that they've dealt with that day, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's work related relationship or whatever. So 
Okay. I don't know if that really answers the question, but I don't, I don't feel that there's a huge difference. I think it helps. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the second thing that, I, uh, I find that has helped me and I don't want to put like, I don't want to put like just like a bandaid over the problem, uh, but it has been a huge help. Is honestly straight up just like Cialis. Cialis, yeah, right? um, yeah. And you know, it's a great thing because Cialis has m many benefits, right? Like blood pressure as well. Um, but I think one of the greatest things about Cialis is like because I know that like I have it available and it helps so much. It also helps my uh, how I psychologically think about it yeah. and my stress about it. Like the fact that I like Cialis is literally always worried for me also honestly makes me have helped me have like literally zero stress in the bedroom regarding the problem whatsoever. And it has great pumps in the gym. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great pumps. It, it's a great pre-workout. Women can take it too. For, I've taken it before I've gone to the gym. Um, but it is like to uh, go to what you said, Band-Aid. It can be used as that until you can sort your life out. If mm -hmm. there's some traumatic event or some stress that you're dealing with, like, Yeah. Cialis, I mean, there's there's actual literature showing low-dose Cialis as a longevity benefit for men. There's actually studies that show it helps body composition. Now they're all going to jump on it. Whoa. Oh, <laughs> really? At like 5 to 10 milligrams daily. But a lot of men take it for the endothelial health benefits, for blood flow, yeah. for um, those benefits, or even BPH, blood pressure, stuff like that. But yeah. yeah. The issue, though, is that like, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, you get a, headaches? I'm a, I'm a, no, no, I don't get headaches, which is a good part, but this is just more transparent talk that I haven't talked about ever, but I'm f might as well fucking do it. So when I was a kid, um, I was an only child. My parents had me locked up in my room. So I would study at all times of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, there's one point where I, I was literally alone. Like my parents were very Asian conservative, like, like you're fat, you're dumb. Like you need to do this. You need to, I don't want to call them out. They're beautiful people. It's just in the culture. Yeah. Um, the relationship is different now, but this is how it was in the past. And, uh, I was a bit straight up, honestly, a little bit suicidal at several points. Uh, but I would still try to fight my way to figure out how I like, I think I just, just as a kid, I just like, I like did things, anything I could do to just like be happy, I guess. So at one point my mom would like set parental controls on my computer at all times of the day. And so in order for me to do work, I had to ask her to unlock the computer. So one day I asked her if she could unlock the computer so I could do some homework. She did, she unlocked it. And I typed a phone like recorder, like camera recorder, mm -hmm. the corner of the room, hit it behind like this bookcase on a shelf, pointed it down towards the computer, asked her to unlock the computer, she did. Then later on, I uh, went to my room, checked it, played a little game of hangman and figured out that the password to our computer was my street address. And um, smart, like 2 a.m. when uh, after she would go to sleep, I would like sneak over to the uh, computer room to like play RuneScape and watch anime. And the craziest part about this is like straight up honest at one point, you know, this was like before this was probably like when I was like maybe nine, 10 years old or something. But this like leaked into my like, preteen and teenage years. And I started fucking having these just hormones that just <laughs> fucking exploded out of nowhere. <laughs> so I just be like feeling things and starting to like, I just start feeling like horny, you know, and then like started feeling explorative and got curious. And then like at, you know, like late two, 3 AM when my parents are asleep, I'd be like researching things. So at one point when I was a kid, I was like, there was a one point where I was like watching, I think porn was too much. I think, but I was watching like sexual stuff pretty consistently. And I'm sure for without a fact that like that had a psychological effect on the rest of my life. But I do find that uh, if I like by really just honestly avoiding porn at all costs nowadays and uh, simply just trying to think about like saving this for my partner, mm -hmm. whoever it may be has honestly helped immensely. It's definitely difficult for sure, but just like stopping sugar or stopping alcohol or stopping any of these things, you know, every week that goes by, it gets easier and easier and easier. Now, the issue with Cialis for me is like, I love to take it for blood pressure, mm -hmm. but I fucking hate having random boners during the day, especially. <laughs> Do you have one right now? No, unfortunately not. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it just, uh, the Cialis like works really well. So it's kind of annoying to like have that happen when I don't need it to happen. Yeah. Cause I feel like more sexually aroused because the boner is, 
is there. <laughs> well, at least you know the equipment works. Yeah, at least you know? the equipment works, yeah. But wait, were you do, somebody who would label themselves addicted to porn? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and what would what classifies as an addiction? Because I've been asked that, and I honestly don't know if it's number of times a day or hours watched. Right, yeah, so I guess that really depends on your definition. And what I've heard from the definition of addiction most often is it's uh, when something is done so consistently at a point where it's a detriment to your daily life mm. and your your living. So, I mean, if porn is starting to affect your love life, then that probably means it's a, it's a, an addiction. If it's not affecting your love life, you have it, like say that like you have a fine love life with your partner, maybe once she gets injured or something and she just can't do anything in the bedroom for a few months and you're like, well, fuck, I'm gonna explode if I don't do something. So at least you like do it a few times just so you don't fucking die. But then when she comes back around, you're able to be like, hey, I need to cut this out. Like, I need to go back to my partner and focus on her. It makes a whole world of difference if you can. So Huge, yeah. And I'm glad that you talked about that too. Because I remember back then, like when I was in seventh grade, sounds like back in your day, <laughs> but like I think I was 12 and I was listening to the radio, which no one listens to anymore. Um, Z100 in New York had this show called Love Phones with Dr. Judy, who was like a sex therapist. And it was on at like 10 p.m. every night. And so I'd put on my Walkman <laughs> and listen to that show. I went to an all girls Catholic school. So you can imagine that like the sex education was like, do not go there. Fucking fantastic. Yes. Like awful. And I remember listening to that like almost every night. And I just took this weird, unique interest in sex. And, and like sexual habits and, you know, stuff like that because it was so sheltering mm -hmm. where 11 years of being in an all girls school, you're just like, you know, what are boys? Like if the janitor walked by, people would like drop their pants and he'd be like <laughs> the ugliest person on earth. Like, Crazy. But it's like a male person, like literally like, you know, the maintenance guys and stuff, like girls would go fucking nuts. And I'm just like, but he's so, you know, but that, that was the culture, you know, and then you learn early on and like, I don't know. I just, I found it fascinating. Like somebody reminded me that I went to high school with, they're like, do you remember that you used to just like shout out random parts of the male anatomy and like ninth grade bio? I'm like, I don't recall that, but it doesn't surprise me either. Cause I'm mm -hmm. weird, but just that's, I guess where like the true uh, learning about men came about is because we were so deprived of men for so long That's so funny <laughs> in school. That is so funny. Um, I grew up Christian and uh, Catholic, and I hold myself. I consider I, uh, I consider spirituality one of the biggest aspects of my life, um, and I align myself with like various religions. Yeah, you know, I, I I resonate with Christianity. I resonate with Hinduism and Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, I love trying to engage in mindfulness on a daily basis, but uh, there is one aspect of the old church where like they demonize certain things, such as like sex and such as, for example, like all priests must be celibate. And then obviously this tended to maybe not intentionally, but cause some priests to do some uh, things with children. Yeah. Like I, uh, I wish that wasn't something that just psychologically affected so many people in such a negative way. But you know, that's, that was society back then, you know, cause um, oh, yeah. I'm sure God, the universe did not want for any of these these things that were placed to cause these tendencies, you know? No. I'm sure there, there was no intent. We had, that, so. so we would have like chapel services. There was a chapel in our school and we would have priests come in from churches locally to perform the services. And one of them was one of those guys. And it just totally like reframes it. And we had to do uh, penance with them, which you like tell them what sins you had and stuff, but it wasn't like in the box, like they show in movies, like where you can't see the priest. It was like how you and I are sitting right now in, in middle and high school. And, and I had to say like what my quote sins were. And I'm like, this isn't the most mortifying thing. No, and then man. knowing what that guy did and having to say that, oh, like shit. thinking back about that, it wasn't until I got to college. My mom was like, Oh, we're not Catholic. I'm like, well then why did you send me to that school for so Whoa. long? But she said she wanted me to be in small classes and have an understanding of what religion was. 
Um, I think technically we were Episcopalian or something, mm-hmm. but um, similar to you, I can resonate with multiple religions, but I wouldn't consider myself religious. I don't go to church anymore because I felt every week throughout my school year <laughs> was enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's interesting that what you're talking on that comes into it and and the policies and stuff. But I think it was also being taught sex ed by a nun is like an oxymoron. Um, cause it's also like, what did they know about it? But they're teaching you so like, it's this bad thing and that you shouldn't learn about it, which of course, anything that someone tells you not to do, you want to do more just like food. If we tell clients not to eat something, they're going to want it more. It's like that deprivation right. mindset. I, I feel like I feel like we could just go about these things in a better way by having a more like open ended type of conversation, 100%. like open ended education, right? Like I remember the Dare program was fucking. I think Dare is considered like unsuccessful, is it not? But I don't know, but I remember that. that I, that's I'm pretty sure I program. searched it up on Google and it said it was like an unsuccessful program or something that was like shut down after some years. But I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not surprised, you know. Well, and now weed yeah. is legal in, in several states, so. I just, I just think like if, if, if we just said like, well, you know, it's, it is hard for me to say this cause I can't, I can't tell like the church what to do. You know, I can't right. tell like if they're going to, if they believe that, then they believe that. But, um, at the same time, like, of course we both know that like telling someone straight up, like this is bad. Like you cannot do this is going to have the opposite effect versus like telling someone like, like if you have sex, the the potential of a pregnancy may happen. And if abortion is illegal in your state and or abortion is against God, then you are going to be stuck with a child that you can't take care of. Your life is going to change forever. Like mm-hmm. just a little bit more open-ended like education, I think is just so much more effective. But You would think hey. that they'd adopt that with the maturity level of educators being adults. I mean, when I was a younger coach in my 20s, I would tell people not to do things and then I matured. And now I realize that the conversation, because this bleeds into coaching where people know what to do. Clearly we've all been preaching the same shit online where we know that you have to exercise, you have to eat well, all this stuff. People know these things. Now we've complicated the message, confused everybody to where they're overwhelmed and they don't know who to believe. So it's an understanding conversation now. If you choose not to listen to me, there's a reason for that. And it's my job to understand that reason as a coach versus just dismiss you as being lazy and not wanting to listen to me. Mm -hmm. How can I best get somebody to where they want to be with empathy? Because I think a, a statement that really resonates is that you have no idea what someone's going through in their life. Now, if, If I told you like, now I want you to walk 5,000 steps today and train three days a week and you did one day a week and you walked 2,000 steps and I would have to understand why instead of saying like, why the fuck aren't you listening to me? Hey, Ali, this is what's going on in my life. But there could also be all these other things behind the scenes that I'm not aware of that how it affects you mentally. Or we make judgments very much on like, how how can this person show up late? How could this person do this all the time? What if they're dealing with a sick parent or relative that they just don't want to talk about? Or Mm -hmm. what if they just beat cancer? Or, you know, obviously you see people in the gym doing things that maybe we would not do or we disagree with. Maybe they're going through rehab and maybe they're not able to do the range of motion that you would or whatever. Because it's so judgmental because now we only see flashes of people's lives on social media. It's very easy to take things out of context. But when it comes to coaching, that is a relationship you're building with a person. Your responsibility is their health. They hired you for a reason. They trust you. That is something that I personally don't take lightly. And I try to understand where someone's coming from. Instead of scolding people, ask them, why do you think this happened? what else is going on? You know, how's your home life? And I've had guys break down and cry just because I asked that question because it has nothing to do with fitness and it has everything to do there with their ability to apply their fitness things. And I think if more coaches or practitioners, and I know we started this conversation with religion, but if if people understood more that, hey, we don't have to be so dogmatic in our approach. And yes, you have to follow the plan and stuff like that. But if there are hiccups, 
there's reasons for that hiccups. Let's try to find that understanding and help somebody work through those because they may not know how to articulate that they need help through that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where I was going with that, but. No, that was great. If you feel like any of the medications that we spoke about today may benefit you, such as BPC-157, GH acutagogues such as tesamorelin, IGF-1, oxandrolone troche, semaglutide, then you can obtain these from Trans and HRT, and the link for that will be in the bio. If you feel like you're experiencing symptoms of low testosterone, such as depression, anxiety, lack of motivation, as well as lack of sex drive, then you can get this checked out as well by getting your blood work done at Transcend, and they will provide you expert medical analysis. Transcend HRT has worked with many professional bodybuilders and pro athletes, such as Thor Bjornsson, Phil Heath, and Jeremy Buendia. And if you feel like this podcast has any relevancy to you, I do believe that this clinic will provide of great benefit to you as well. People like came at me in ways that I'd never seen. And really? I was like, now I understand to a greater level the effect that bullying can have in people. Yeah. What, what was the real thing I'm asking? And why did they come? A uh, podcast we did in August, but uh, it was talking about um, when men go on TRT and their sex drive goes up, they ask me how, how can we get their wife to join them or whatever. And then I talked about how at that time I was on TRT. I've been off since December, but at that time I'm like, yeah, I've been on TRT for like two years and, you know, talked about the benefits and everything from women. And they came at me, they're like, you know, women don't have testosterone. Why do you have to take testosterone? I'm like, really interesting. Women have testosterone. Yeah. And just like, you know, you look like a man, nobody gets as jacked as you naturally, like you're on more than TRT and just like, uh, and like the camera angle I had, and I had a tank top on the camera angle made me look yoked. I was like, I'm 125 pounds. Like you see me in person now, right? Yeah. Like I am not a giant human, Yeah. but people were like making it off to be like, I got ridiculously massive because of my TRT dose, which was six milligrams. <laughs> It just sounds like some dumbasses. <laughs> it sounds like some dumbasses. Yeah. If someone's going to say women don't have TRT, then I'm not going to, or women don't have testosterone. I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm like, okay, to. clearly I just not even engaging. Yeah. You know, and of course all their profiles are private and no photo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Says the internet. Yeah. We love it. So I was curious though. Um, so since I kind of expressed like the thoughts that I've had in order to, for my personal life, try to, try to improve my, you know, my boner quality in my sex life? Like how, how can we do that to the best of our ability, both psychologically and hormonally? I would say, um, so for somebody who's maybe not made fitness a lifestyle like you and I, say they want to, they want to get to that point, but maybe they haven't embarked on a, a journey yet. Um, eliminating alcohol, I think is a great first step. Reducing it is going to be progress. And I, I wouldn't say everybody has to cut it cold turkey. But again, if you're what I would say over like 17% body fat as a man, then alcohol is not going to help you get lower. And quite frankly, it's going to fuck with your hormones and it just doesn't do, do anything positive. And a lot of guys use it as a coping mechanism, a stress reliever. They say, you know, it helps me sleep. It doesn't, it helps you pass out. It's yeah. very disruptive to sleep. Um, An analogy I've heard before is like, so, like being hit with a baseball bat in your head isn't necessarily going to give you great sleep. No, like, but yeah, but it'll out. knock you out. I mean, if that's what you're looking for. <laughs> um, eating more protein than they should, or they are. So usually women are the ones who are actually uh, said to be under eaters. But a lot of the guys that we deal with under eat for what they're doing Makes and, sense. It, and it could be any activity and especially like BJJ guys. Stuff is, like it, is it mostly like tall white dudes too? Tall? Is white? Tall, would tall white dudes be a more <laughs> They're a big population of it. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's pretty much everybody. Um, and it's because they've gotten caught up in a lot of the um, information that's just confusing. This diet Carnivore, keto, you know, we, we go through different cycles. Like the pendulum swings really, you know, far. Like in the 80s and 90s, fat was demonized. Like low fat everything, Snackwell's cookies, if you grew up in the 80s like I did. Everything was low fat, low fat, low fat. And then the pendulum swung hard the other way and it was all the fat. And it was not only eat fat, but add fat to fat to make yourself better at using fat. And then that blew up in our face. And now it was low carb and, 
you know, high carb is making a comeback and now we're on to demonizing protein. And I think fiber is going to be next. Like it, it's just ridiculous. Are we demonizing, are we demonizing protein? Yeah. Protein right is now? carcinogenic and bad and people get so triggered. It's crazy. Yeah. And I, like I posted something on protein the other day and people are still commenting, well, too much is bad for you. And I said, you are coming from a antiquated thought process. If you have a kidney disease, then maybe, yeah, really high protein is going to be a problem. But I leverage it in all our clients. Anyone I've worked with has usually eaten sub the amount that they would feel best at, but also to help rectify any loss in muscle mass and also help being full because people will say, well, these are bodybuilder doses and you know, people don't need to eat that much protein. And I'm like, okay, but if you're dieting hard and you actually want to drop body fat, why wouldn't you increase your protein levels to make you full? And it's pretty much a very difficult process for your body to take protein yeah. and turn it into fat. I'm almost sure without a doubt, like up to like 1.2, you know, times your weight, you're going to still be seeing a better composition of muscle to fat. Oh yeah. Like, so, I mean, and there's no other macro that single-handedly will do that better than protein. So I just don't see Thank why you. you wouldn't want to at least maximize your benefits. Like you're not, if you're not a bodybuilder, then you don't have to like take the amount of protein that steroid steroided bodybuilders yeah. are taking. You don't have to eat 300 grams like I am. That's right. probably ridiculous for you. <laughs> but high compared to average is, is not that much. But more than 90, I would idea. say, you know, you'll be okay. Yeah. I mean, I've had guys who are 200 pounds and they're coming in at 140 grams. And I'm like, all right, we can do better than this. Mm -hmm. Because it also helps with curbing cravings because a lot of people deal with snacking at night or they deal with restrict throughout the week and then it blows up on the weekends because either they're drinking in addition to that or they're trying to white knuckle it throughout the week and then they just don't even know what they're eating throughout the weekend. And I said, there's really no difference if you're eating 1800 calories throughout the week, 5,000 on the weekends. Well, what if we take that average and split it up across mm -hmm. the seven days? There's no difference okay. in that. So this is going to help with fat loss, which then further helps with the boners. Yes. Is what you're getting. Okay. So I actually have had guys who they've had issues with boners and they're eating sub 2000 calories, which for a man who is active in weight training is not really going to be enough for most dudes. And they feel the effects of that where they're tired. They don't feel that they've really improved in body composition. Um, they don't feel sex drive. They don't get rock hard erections. And it's the same process as stress where your body is starving and it's just trying to keep you alive and it's not going to prioritize procreating. So it doesn't care about your boner. It cares about keeping you alive. And so I've increased calories on guys to the point where you could call it predicted maintenance. And within like two weeks, they're like, oh my God, my sex drives back. Mm -hmm. They feel yep. better. They can perform in the gym. A lot of it has to do, it could be just food. And I, I'm contributing to a book that my friend Steve Murphy's writing on erectile dysfunction. And I'm talking about how overtraining, undertraining, under eating, all these things and how nutrition and fitness can contribute to low sex drive and erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. But just adding calories alone. I mean, we all know what it's like to come out of a diet and then you increase calories again. And you're like, oh, I feel human. Or you have more carbs and you're like, oh, I feel great. There's a reason for that. And it does affect guys hormonally. But I think a lot of guys are very eager to shed body fat. So they go through the cycle where they cut calories drastically low. They increase their activity. When that stops working, they keep doing that again. Calories go lower. Activity goes higher. They may drop body fat, but then they're like, well, damn, now I'm small. I feel skinny fat. Yeah, I don't feel like I look like I lift mm -hmm. and I don't feel like I look how I should. So they go into like an emergency bulk. They add too many calories too quickly. They add a ton of water weight. They add more body fat than ideal, quicker than ideal. And then they're like, well, shit, now I got to cut calories again. And it's that vicious cycle where they never get anywhere. And I tell them you can add calories and match your training and your nutrition to the point that you don't look sloppy. Some of our guys increase... 20 to 40 pounds in, in their non-diet phases and they still have abs and they still look the part. But a lot of guys 
you know, they're coming from where they maybe messed up or they saw friends who gained too much body fat and went through that vicious cut and cycle um, or cut and bulk cycle. No one has to do these crazy bulks. You don't have to eat this massive excess of calories to put on muscle. You can even put on some muscle in a deficit, keeping protein really high. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be like, oh shit, I got to eat 6,000 calories in order to gain muscle. It doesn't have to Mm -hmm. be that way. What other things have you done or do you guys do to uh, improve people's boners and like sexual? Um, so the, the nutrition side of that, the stress management side of that. So I think that's helping people become aware of like what they're doing. What are you doing with your time at night? Like if you don't have kids and you know, you're a single guy, are you on your screen? How much phone time, you know, are you doing stuff like that? Are you getting outside and getting daylight? Um, Mm -hmm a lot of that will help the stress, just bringing down the stress. And a lot of that times it's looking at what can we control? So if they do have kids, all right, we can't always control kids and what they do and if they wake up in the middle of the night and stuff like that, but we can control how we we react to that. So if you're lifting four days a week and your kid has woken up in the middle of the night every single day, maybe we only get in two days that week and we don't exacerbate the issue and the impact on your body by trying to push through something when you don't feel so good and that's okay. And then maybe the next week we're back on track. So looking at what is controllable, nutrition is always going to be controllable. We can control how much we eat and how much um, quality that we have most for the most part, unless you're going out and stuff like that. We help guys navigate going out to dinner, you know, choosing prioritizing protein adding a tablespoon of oil to your chronometer just to account for what people cook with. Just being aware of those things and what goes in your body can then help you stay on track in the long run. If you miss, you know, one night of bad sleep, it's not going to kill you. Like I wouldn't listen to your tech or wearable saying like, don't train, you know, you might die. Like that's not going to happen. But managing the stress and managing the reaction and doing the things that they can control because we don't always have control over the stressors or bad sleep and stuff like that. Um, I had a curious question. Uh, so yeah. your youngest client on testosterone, Cole, what all did you guys do to help improve his testosterone? Uh, everything I was mentioning. So he was pretty high body fat. Um, he, he came to us, he had just started testosterone replacement. So he had just started that and basically we helped him shed the rest of his fat. So the way we did this was, um, I look at it very simply because I try to simplify everything for Mm -hmm. guys to understand where they should start. So I call it like GPP for TRT. So in the fitness industry, GPP stands for general physical preparation. So it's kind of like the phase that you go through before you specialize for a sport. So this can be for somebody on or off TRT. It doesn't matter. So the starting point is looking at body composition. So if a man is over 15 upwards of 20% body fat, all right, we have some fat to lose. We're going to go lower carb, high protein, moderate fat. The first phase of training is going to be highly aerobic, low intensity stuff that guys hate to do. So it's usually the stuff that guys don't want to do. They hate doing, but they have to do it. And then a lot of higher reps and maybe a lot of unilateral stuff like split squats and other shit that people really hate. So I'm like, listen, you're going to hate us when we go through this, but it's going to be life changing. So I think Cole started at 50 or 75 grams of carbs, but from vegetables. So it was pretty, really low carb. Body fat comes off as they go and trend towards 15 to 12%. Then we can start increasing carbohydrates because now they're better tolerant of it. So they have a little more muscle. If you don't have muscle, your carbs really, they don't have anywhere to go. Yep. So muscle provides a storage compartment for the carbohydrates. Plus your body's more insulin sensitive, which means it tolerates carbs a lot better. So then that helps drive performance in the gym. Then we can transition to more of a hypertrophy phase. Then they'll see the more hard muscles popping and the denseness, and then they enjoy the lifting. They have the carbs now to propel them through that and perform really well. So then it almost like, it's almost like body composition and aesthetics become a byproduct of the performance gains in the gym. Cause they're like, Oh man, this is a PR I'm lifting heavier. So Cole got really pumped about being able to press more squat, more, all this stuff. And then body fat just dropped off him because that was a byproduct. He wasn't so heavily stressed out and focused on what he looked like. 
And over the course of, I think it's coming, we're coming up on two years now, um, he looks ridiculous. And he's just so pumped to be able to go through phases now where he can add weight, uh, like body body weight, mm-hmm. and not feel like it's going to spiral out of control. Like he knows that's necessary to add a little bit to be able to gain more muscle. And getting so lean, and, and he competed last year, he realized like, oh, wow, like I can build here, I can build here, like... Now I don't feel so weird about gaining weight to put on more muscle because I know it's going to come off. I think a lot of people feel like it's not going to come off because they didn't have success getting it off before. Mm -hmm. So they're afraid to gain weight. Uh, So I thought that initially though, like you guys tried to boost his natural production of testosterone and then at some point like did it not work and then he jumped on TRT? No, I'm pretty sure he came to us already on it. Oh, really? Okay. He before us, that's what he did. So, oh, and now I'm going based off a podcast I did with him of what he said he did, where he he had done all the lifestyle stuff or what he thought was the right thing, and started working out, started eating a lot better, all those things, and his test still didn't budge. And okay. Yeah, and he was really really low, and so he's been on um, since. Yeah, he's 27 now, so he's been on since 25, I, I think. Okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So my friend I was talking about actually, uh, he, uh, so his testosterone when he first got checked before he ever started running anything was like 430. Um, and he's a little younger than me. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a surprise for someone in their mid 20s, I think. And then obviously, yeah. when we found out later uh, what his testosterone is now after that year after he just stopped TRD Cold Turkey, it is about like 320 maybe. So. And I would assume that this was lower right after he got off, right? So basically he's been, you know, just cruising this entire year with a total testosterone level of probably anywhere from 200 to three, 300. So uh. um, it, I find that interesting because it's like, uh, a, you know, these things, uh, there's just so much variance with everybody. There's so much variance with like your testosterone levels. Um, and just like you said in previous podcasts that I love to stress to people, like you could be at a total level of 900, but feel the same way as somebody at a level of probably 500, right? Yeah. It just depends on who you are. Um, and one of the things too, that like had me thinking about this was again, like my Prometheus results, uh, like one of the things that I really found that was really super interesting was I found out that I, um, am, it said impaired muscle performance Mm -hmm. um and this related to me responding a lot better like i think i uh uh i think my body is more prominent with type 1 fibers and i respond a lot better to higher reps and endurance so not explosive power not really great for that which kind of helps me feel a lot better about how hard i've been working to improve my strength and i'm never (laughs) as strong as anyone else yeah um but it makes sense too why I feel a lot better when I'm doing leg day at like at least 20 reps with slow eccentrics versus other people who seem to still be just doing squats at like 12 reps and they, they're fine and they grow. So it's cool to see like that is a massive difference. That is yeah. a huge difference. Now you think about like just testosterone levels, things that are a lot harder to, to put into like quantitative measures. Just like for example, how you feel, man, the variance is probably crazy. So it's, I, I don't think it's a great idea for us to compare to other people or compare to each other. Just go to a clinic and be like, I feel like this. So let's get you to a better place, respective of where you were before. Yeah. I think a lot of guys wear their testosterone number as their bench press number. And they're only going by that. And they're like, well, my test was 500. And I'm like, that, you know, <coughs> doesn't mean everything. There's so yeah. much more that goes into that. And if you have not done testosterone, you have to look at your LH and FSH and see, okay, is there primary or secondary hypogonadism? Meaning, is this a brain issue which can be impacted by stress or PTSD or if somebody's had a concussion, if they've been in the military and been near explosives, that's all going to disrupt that signal? Or have you had testicular trauma? Do you have a varicocele? You know, have you been a cyclist for a hundred years and maybe that's impacted that or somebody kicked you in the nuts or you're just older and your balls don't work anymore. So a lot goes into this. So that's why those numbers are important. What is your free testosterone? What is your thyroid doing? Because that can impact your mood and your energy and all that stuff. So just looking at testosterone alone is like saying, hey, I have very limited ankle mobility on my left side. That's great. I want to know what the rest of your body does. 
does mm-hmm. your right side do? What does your upper body do? Mm-hmm. You know, if, if a, a coach looked at somebody's squat and you gave them the information of, well, my ankle on the left side moves. Okay. Every coach is going to want to see how your hips move, how your other ankle moves, what your T-spine does, everything else. So it's not the whole picture. And I think subjective feedback is huge because there are a lot of doctors and clinics that will only go by what it says on the piece of paper. And we both know that if you go through insurance or some sort of primary care physician, they have to go by what the insurance wants them to do, is, which is be sub 300. Mm-hmm. So you can be a man who's 26, who's 27, you know, 35 and have test levels of 300, 320 and be told you're fine, you're normal. Well, no, normal is a average of everybody in America, whether they're overweight, they're fat, you know, sick, like all this stuff. And it doesn't account for age and it doesn't account for even be people being on TRT. So that range is also huge. And it's also been reduced twice in the last few decades. So what is normal anymore? It doesn't matter. How do you feel? I have friends who test levels of 600, heavy symptoms. They feel amazing on TRT. It can be life-changing. Wow. Yeah. But it, it's, and it's something that I feel very strongly as an advocate about because it can help a man's mental health so profoundly. Yeah. Because how many people do you know who have the same symptoms of depression that they do of low testosterone? Mm -hmm. They're going to be put on an SSRI. It's going to make things worse. It's going to even make their boner worse. So it it sucks that that's not the first thing that people think of um, when women go through menopause or when women have hormonal issues. No one really bats an eye if they go on hormone replacement, but with men... A lot of men are still attached to those stig- stigmas where it's cheating or it's bad or it's going to kill you or anything else actually can be quite transformative. And, and the coolest thing for me as a coach is seeing a client who maybe wasn't ready for TRT when they came to us. They had to go through getting themselves in shape, getting their lifestyle in order, getting all those boxes checked. And then testosterone was like the icing on the cake. And then it brings everything together and they are now a more confident, assertive person right before your eyes, even in the way they speak. Yeah. Like I, I've almost cried yeah. many times talking about it because I've literally sat with them on Zoom and been like, do you see yourself right now? I should record our first conversations because it's just so like night and day. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and they're like, my wife is so thankful. Like mm-hmm. that is huge because you can show up now as the man she wants them to right. be and like... Yeah, it's just amazing. It's fucking hard in this society because us men just want to be fucking strong by ourselves, you know? We want to be like, oh, we did it ourselves. Like, we don't fucking need shit like this. But but the the fucking fact is, like, we're not all born the same, so. No. And it sucks, but um, TRT has definitely been super helpful for so many people. And I don't want to be biased about, the about like, I, I do feel like personally I would say from my experiences, I have to be an advocate for it. I don't want to be biased, but it's helped me personally and mentally. Uh, I, I just, I think, uh, my perspective, um, confidence has always been something I've, I've had, that has always been important Mm -hmm. to me, but, uh, I can feel the difference between my ability to be decisive, um, and assertive. I can just feel the difference. And it's cool when like you know that you have to do something as a man and you do it anyways, but then when it feels easier and easier to do it because your hormones are in the right place, it's a fucking sick feeling. It's sick. Cause then it's just like, it's like, this is me. Like, this is easy. Like yes. I don't even have to second think it, you know? There, there's nothing sexier as a female than a man being able to be like decisive action. We're take, we're doing this, you mm-hmm. know? If, if I were to say to my husband, um, you know, let, let's go to dinner Saturday. And he was like, all right, I don't know where to go. Where do you want to go? Well, I'll do whatever you want to do. I, I would be annoyed, Yep. you know, and we want guys to, I don't want to say save us, but like be able to take care of us in that sense outside of like the stereotype of a man financially taking care of a woman. I'm talking about like, can you help me fix things? Can you do stuff, you know? Not saying everyone has to be a handyman. Somebody's going to come after me for whatever I'm saying. But I think you know where I'm getting at, where take the lead in certain things because that allows the woman to show up like in her feminine side, you know? 
And if testosterone is the pathway and the delivery method for somebody to be able to do that, to be able to have that confidence, I think is huge for a guy. Because there are a lot of guys who don't have that confidence and, mm -hmm. and they are very passive and they, they do feel they have to ask permission for a lot of things and they don't want to, but they just don't have the confidence to be able to change that. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Uh, my belief is that for a man, it is uh, it is very enjoyable to do those things. If you're a strong man that is ingrained in his, in his masculinity, it is very, it's fun. It's yeah. like fun to lead. It's fun to make the decisions. It's fun to bring a girl wherever. It's just fucking exciting, you know? Um, but if I want to look even deeper into it, I can't deny that the desire increases with your level of testosterone. Yeah. The desire or the, the excitement that I, I feel from it I believe increases with it. So, I mean, you know, maybe maybe you feel a certain way based off of how you're born, based off of the testosterone level that you're born with. But like, say that you were born with low testosterone and then you jumped on TRT. I don't think there's anything wrong with making yourself feel better about the things you want to do, you know? Totally, I can't agree more. And I don't feel men should feel bad about that or be made to feel bad about that. And if they do have people telling them that they're cheating, uh, okay, if you have to cheat at life in order to show up as the best person, father, husband, whatever, fine, cheat at life. Mm -hmm. Like really, you're not playing a professional sport, like whatever. I, people are very quick to make judgments. And that could be because their friend is scared of TRT and maybe hasn't done you know, the proper research and advocating for it for themselves. But that's why I feel very strongly and it's my life's work mm -hmm. to be able to get men to talk about this openly so that they don't feel that they're going to be judged or it's, you know, this overwhelming stigma attached to them. Because for every troll out there, there are five guys that are so grateful that the fact that we can openly talk about this and help them to admit, yeah, maybe I'm struggling mentally you know what? I don't feel like the man that I have the potential to be. I want to show up as a better father. I right. want to be a better husband. There are solutions for that. Right. The way that I see it is like, we're not changing ourselves. We're just putting ourselves in the position to be the man we're supposed to be. Uh, just kind of like the same way. Like, I don't know, I, I like, you know, I, I don't know this very well. So I'm just making uh, a rough comparison, but like say a female or a woman, with postmenstrual syndrome. I think as a man, you would want your partner to at least medically discuss this with a doctor and potentially get any sort of help or treatment for this in order for her to feel her best self and feel like who she is supposed to be, like feel normal, you know? Um, same thing I'd say for a guy, like if you are at a good level of testosterone and this is how you act, I would say maybe this is, this is you, you know, mm -hmm. this is, you feel great, this is how you're supposed to be. But if you feel like shit, and maybe you do actually have like a level of 200, you know, milligrams of testosterone, like I'd say there's nothing wrong with feeling like you want to improve that in order for yourself to feel better. No. So no. maybe I shouldn't use the word should, but I think you understand what I'm getting at. No, I, I do. And I think maybe feeling empowered to be able to speak up and, and to seek the help that mm -hmm. can really be so transformative, you mm -hmm. know. It's admirable. Are any of your clients um, on anabolics that maybe have encountered like issues with their sexual desire or boners or anything like that? Mm, one did where he paired three DHTs, which I think had a very suppressive effect on his estrogen. Mm. Cause I said, let Whoa. me know if your joints get cranky or you start experiencing boner issues and any mood swings. And that happened. And so I was like, okay, it could be time to <laughs> yeah. change things around because, you know, estrogen going too low can really cause problems for guys. And that's a pretty hot topic in the TRT space because a lot of the clinics, especially where I live in Florida, they hand the same protocol out to everybody that comes in the door, 200 milligrams of test. It used to be HCG. Now they've tried to substitute it with gonadarellin and then an astrozole. Not every man needs that protocol. Mm -hmm. And estrogen is so important for men. At a TRT dosage, there's really no reason to block or suppress it. And most a lot of the time, of most of the time. Most right. of the time, yeah. Because I compare it to, I explain this to them because the guys lose their mind and they're like, I'm going to get gyno and all this stuff. And I'm like, calm down. I'm like, 
Think of a woman when she goes through menopause, she loses estrogen. What happens when she loses estrogen? Her bone density goes down. Insulin resistance goes up. She gets belly fat. She becomes um, prone to osteoporosis. This can happen to men too. And that's where their joints will get cranky. And I've seen guys, DEXA scans, who have been on crazy doses of anastrozole and they're almost uh, osteoporotic. Is that a word? Osteoporotic. And they're like 42 years old. And I'm like, why are the, why are we doing this? Cause they're trying to keep estrogen in a range and the way estrogen works in men, which I've learned from my friend, Jordan Grant is it's not reflective of what's actually in the tissue when you see it on lab work. So say, you know, I think the range is like 30 to 50 where on a lot of labs, if it goes higher than that, people freak out and it's only part of what is in a guy. So it, it's similar if like I went to Bill Gates and said, how much money do you have, Bill? Let me look in your wallet. It's only a little fraction of a glimpse. And the way it works in men is the way it works in women in menopause where it doesn't get produced by a gland and it's a paracrine hormone. So blocking it or suppressing it without any logic can be detrimental because it is cardioprotective. It's neuroprotective. Mm -hmm. Guys feel good when their estrogen is at a level that allows them to have good boners. They can literally lose their boner if their estrogen is suppressed at levels yep. to where they feel like shit. Um, and if you know anybody who has literally heavily suppressed or blocked their estrogen, they don't feel so hot. That's me. So I, uh, that's probably one of the biggest reasons why I couldn't have a boner for so long is for like the first three years or so of me like actually finally committing to like running gear, like doing injections. Uh, after I figured out that my testosterone was suppressed and crashed, I uh, I would keep my estrogen super low, so I looked dry. So I looked dry and lean and shredded. I, uh, you know, I was young, so it was fucking stupid. But God damn, did I feel fucking bad? Yeah, I felt like such ass all the time. I felt irritable. I felt like my bones were fucking weak as hell. I felt just fucking unhappy. Uh, fucking no boners. Just fucking like just dog shit, dog shit. Fucking skin was dry. Started getting eczema sometimes. Just so bad, and um, I just I, I was having a hard time like finding the, <laughs> the a good balance for estrogen, um, and also I was like I think I got my blood work done a few times, but I didn't like to get it too frequently. So it was like a hard it was a hard place for me because I was like doing all this experimentation with by myself without a coach so yeah I was dealing for some time with like like I added Mastron and Primo um that was my my first big cycles when I added both Mastron and Primo and I didn't really understand just how much they would suppress my test but I wanted to use them to make my physique look a little drier yeah uh, not understanding that they both suppressed my test significantly because I was taking both of them at, at a dose higher than I was my, my testosterone. Like I didn't really want to take tests higher than TRT to higher than even 200, but my mass and primo together was definitely higher than that. Yeah. So I think my estrogen level was probably like 10 maybe. Yeah. And dude, ugh, <laughs> the worst. <laughs> and it, it's awful. And, and it's like, there, there's so many times where I've talked to guys where, you know, they've either had uh, boner issues or they just don't feel good. And they're like, my joints hurt. Like I'm leg pressing and my joints hurt. Like mm -hmm. this is crazy. And I asked them, well, what are you on? And it's a milligram of an astrosol every single day. And I'm like, oh my God. And I tell them, well, I can't legally tell you to come off a medication. However, there is a discussion to be had here because there's a reason you're feeling this way, you know, and it's not because of the exercise you're doing because you were doing this exercise before and you had no joint problems. You didn't have ED issues before. So that's a common thing because yeah. guys think testosterone will help their boner. And if they're on this heavy AI dose, then all of a sudden that goes away. Then they're like, Oh, what do I do? They increase the test dose or they just think something else is wrong with them. Yeah. Also started ruining my relationships because I just started having less emotions and felt just irritable instead. Yeah. My main emotion was like irritability rather than <laughs> <laughs> like empathizing and connecting with my partner. Yeah. Estrogen's very like, uh, it's good for the brain. Yeah. You know, it, it does part of the benefit of testosterone replacement is because now people realize low testosterone puts you at risk of heart attacks. Low testosterone puts you at bigger risk of cancers and stuff like that. And the benefit is from it converting into estrogen because it does have that protection. Mm -hmm. But many guys in a lot of these clinics are just very quick to just smash that because right. it's thought of as bad. 
well, women need testosterone. Why wouldn't men need estrogen? What is the mechanism on to, on increasing your testosterone, actually decreasing cholesterol or potentially improving your cholesterol? I feel like I heard that somewhere on a podcast. Yes, it did. does that. However, the mechanism, I can't uh, duplicate. Okay. But <laughs> just like, I'm assuming just like, given that this is a good level of testosterone for you, then it'll help benefit it. As yeah. long as it's like not too high or too low. It, it, it can, it now it can bring down HDL primarily, but it can lower levels altogether. Yeah. And a lot of guys actually have heard the opposite and they're like, well, I don't want to go into testosterone because it's going to increase my cholesterol. I'm like, that's not testosterone. That's other things that can really destroy lipids. Okay. Anabolics and stuff like that that can really gotcha. mess with there we it. Go. Yeah. I see. Yeah. But guys, and again, cholesterol is also like, you know, many guys are put on a statin at cholesterol of 201. Probably not warranted. There's there's reasons why cholesterol goes up and down. Some of it is genetic, some of it's diet, lifestyle related, all of that. But I wouldn't say even at a level of 230, it's really overly concerning. Um, I know a lot of doctors who realize that total cholesterol is not as important as we usually made it years ago, especially as a risk to heart attack. It's more looking at ApoB, ApoA, inflammation markers, insulin resistance, all those things. So if I have a guy whose cholesterol is like, you know, 240, and then his triglycerides are low and his inflammation is low, insulin, glucose, all that stuff, I'm not really overly concerned. Now, if his trigs are like 800 or something like where, oh shit, this needs to be handled now, and he's got high CRP or inflammation, and he's just basically swimming in inflammation, that means usually they have a higher body fat percentage, that warrants a lot of attention right away. Okay. And usually guys need to see that sometimes because they think, you know, oh, well, you know, I like a little belly on myself and my wife likes it or whatever. Okay, but how about this is going to kill you? And now you see it on paper. And that usually will promote reason for them to do something about it. Gotcha. You know? Mm -hmm. What were you saying again before about um, Anavar versus Primo? And then I think you were, you were specifying for females especially, or for women especially. But I think you, I remember you saying something along the lines too of like uh, the difference between Primo and Anavar affecting your cholesterol levels. Uh, yeah, I think Anavar has a more potent dramatic effect on lipid levels than Primo. Primo is considered the most mild, mild steroid for men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a DHT similar to Anavar. <laughs> the problem now is that with, like with Anavar and they kind of, people can't really prescribe it anymore. It's um, changed a lot, but it used to be a lot more easily available. But clinics were giving it at crazy doses for guys like 25, 50, 100 milligrams. In, in the pharmaceutical industry, it comes in two and a half and 10 milligram pills. That's really where most people should start, men included. Many women should start at around two and a half, but a lot of them are starting. I've seen women prescribe 50 milligrams Ooh. from Florida clinics. And I'm just like, why? Like no one needs that much. It's crazy. And, mm. and they give it for like low or I'm sorry, high SHBG because it will bring sex hormone binding globulin down. Mm. I, but that's not like a diagnostic <laughs> reason. Right. And it Especially was created and FDA approved as a muscle wasting medication and for AIDS patients mm -hmm. and burn victims. Like it can help with that. But it's given out like candy at doses that are way too high for people. And so it destroys their lipids and can really lower H or, or increase um, cholesterol and LDL mm -hmm. and lower SHBG to like single digit. Right. I guess I've always been curious as to why I see most uh, uh, coaches tend to like give Anavar to their female clients rather than like Primo. I think because number one, Primo is hard to get real, mm -hmm. like a real source and it's injectable for the most part. Anavar, there are people out there that are like, if you take something orally, it doesn't count. <laughs> you know, it only counts if you inject it. <laughs> so it's like known as the girl drug and it's an oral. So, oh, it must be safe. Okay. <laughs> Anything associated with a needle. That's why testosterone still is very highly demonized because it comes in a needle. Like the, the picture of a needle alone. And a lot of guys don't know that you could actually inject with an insulin needle. They're picturing like yeah, an 18 gauge, like horse needle. Right. 
you know, so they're scared of needles. And I understand that guys are scared of needles. There, there is test cream and that's an alternative, but just the needle alone or the fact that you're injecting feels wrong. Mm -hmm. So it feels like they're doing something wrong. Yeah, I can, I can get that. Uh, I've been doing insulin needles for my entire life, just daily, just cause I like to do it. And I think, uh, it's also psychological that I like to be that frequent meticulous. and meticulous <laughs> because of like the hormone fluctuations and yeah. just limiting hormone fluctuations altogether. But man, I feel great all the time. Like as like the more, the more minimal my hormone fluctuations, of course, the better I feel. Yeah. And so doing this like the last year or so, I've just felt fucking amazing all the time, which is a great thing, especially like being on like anabolics where like just a, a little fluctuation and it can, can make put some different. people off edge. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a question that comes up a lot is injection frequency. And uh, my buddy Dave Lee, he's awesome. He deals with a lot of guys who are uh, more hypogonadal, who are younger. But he gets um, asked that too. And he says, a man should inject as many times as he's willing to adhere to mm. because to align with the natural release pattern. Yep. Some guys don't want to be bothered with every day, but the minimum would be twice a week. Anything less than that, once a week or less is still prescribed at some places. And yeah, when I, guys yep. change, it, it's like life changing. I fucking had to tell so many of my friends actually to like not listen to their clinic because their clinic is giving them once a week. And I'm like, dude, yeah. I don't know why they're prescribing you this, but I promise you even doing it just at least twice or three times a week is going to make a huge difference. And they freak out because they're like, God. well, I don't want to do anything wrong. I'm like, you're not going off plan if you do this. Like if you're on a hundred milligrams, just split it into 50, 50. Yeah, yeah. Like you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to do whatever you want. You know, you could even go three days a week and split it up 25 or whatever. Um, but they, they uh, don't realize that that release pattern and aligning with what your body naturally does can be so much better because you don't have these wild spikes. And I asked them like, well, how do you feel at day six where you're coming at the end of your last shot? do you feel as good as the day after your first shot or your, your shot? And they're like, no, I'm like, split it up. See how you feel. Yeah. You know, cause the clinics who also give the once a week injections are the ones who are tweaking dosage based off blood work. Mm -hmm. And they may not ask if a client comes in the day after his shot, after doing labs the day after, and his test level is above a thousand. Cause that's like their, their range. Oh, we have to lower your dose. They don't even say, well, when was your last shot? Because if it was yesterday, yeah, your dose, your levels might be crazy. And then by the end of the week, they might be at like 700, you know? So they're making prescriptive changes based off what the blood work says and not how the patient feels. Mm -hmm. So just stuff like that where it's probably best for most guys to do two to three days a week. If they're willing to do more, then absolutely do more. If they feel better at two to three days a week, then two to three days a week is the answer. There's no law that says you must inject this amount of times because everybody is different. Would you happen to have any recommendations for someone who's on anabolics that is losing their sex drive or can't get a butter? Uh, Cialis. Cialis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it. you know, how long is their cycle? And obviously like the dosages and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. that's a tough one. Um, some of them are more prone to it than others like Nandrolone and... And if they have just an overall high load Fucking um, of anabolics altogether. And then if you pair that with hard dieting, like, yeah, you're not going to have really high sex drive. Dude, MPP plus hard dieting would be crazy. <laughs> that would be <laughs> rough. That'd be rough. Yeah. You'd be very just like apathetic and just kind of staring at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, sometimes like even on like the, even on the, the small dose that I added on top, like I could feel like I felt like my dick got like 30% less numb or more numb, 30% more numb. Like, numb, really? Yeah. It's, it's a weird feeling, but like, like whenever I first did, like the first time I ever tried, like actually taking a, a good dose of Nandrolone and I tried it both with tests and without test, dick was just like, wouldn't get hard, but honestly kind of felt like, uh, it's not necessarily numb, but the stimulation is just not there. Like it, it like could be like my finger. So oh. that's what it feels like by, by what I mean, like numb, like just numb stimulation. So like taking a small dose, I can already feel like it's like, like, you know, like 70% stimulation <laughs> of what it used to be. Oh, I can't so, imagine. And it's different for everybody too. 
It is because there's some guys that have zero issues. Yeah. And they've taken actually like high doses of DECA and just no problems. Mm -hmm. And then there's guys that take like 100 milligrams that are like, I can't. Or even 50 actually is the lowest that I've heard somebody have problems on. I'm like, damn. Damn, 50 is hell. Of <laughs> yeah. So even that, that, like people can be just so hypersensitive. Mm -hmm. But again, that's why everyone's different. Yep. I always say like, if you're going to try something, just start low. Yep. You know? Even if someone's like, it's like, my, you know, try this diet because it worked for me. That doesn't mean try the exact same calories because it worked for them. Just because this dosage worked for your friend, that does not mean do what they did. Mm -hmm. My highly scientific anabolic. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I think I felt a little bit better on MPP than DECA, but I know that changes yeah, other people too. Yeah, because the half-life. All right. Do you want to go through these uh, this Q&A really, really quickly? Sure. And then, of course, just like usual, going over time. That's how you know it's a good podcast. It's fun. Pete says, Pete Mon asks, uh, high lipids negatively impact T levels? Heard cholesterol is needed for hormones though. Yes. So hormones are manufactured by cholesterol, mm -hmm. which is why um, guys who are on high doses of statins may see a suppressive effect where their cholesterol, I've seen, God, uh -huh. I think the lowest cholesterol I've ever seen is 107. And total? Total. Wow, that and, is very and guys low. are like, my cholesterol is 107. I'm like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a good thing. Um, so that that is needed. However, if somebody is on TRT, then that really kind of negates the need for higher cholesterol producing hormones. And that also has to do with how healthy somebody is because it's produced in the mitochondria. If you don't have healthy mitochondria, which we all learned in bio class is the powerhouse of the cell, but that's literally where energy is made. And the best way to build that is through low level aerobic exercise, which guys are afraid to do because they think their muscles will melt off, but they won't. So quick side tangent on that. The healthier you are aerobically, the better you can recover between sets, between workouts, the more food that you can eat and the more that you can tolerate it. Naja Bra asks, Amanaria in female athletes. I know your post says she specializes in male health, <laughs> but would be great to hear about the female side too. That was it? Yeah. So amenorrhea is losing your period, and that can be a result of over-dieting, um, over-training, taking anabolics. When I say I specialize in men, like I literally know way more about men's hormones than women's. So I will say just from the work that I have done with women, if a woman loses her period due to dieting, unless she's competing, which you kind of have to see that through, um, you do want to bring calories back as high as possible, as quick as possible to mm -hmm. recover that. I've heard that from a lot of the male coaches as well. <laughs> yeah. Like I really enjoyed my podcast with um, the mutual friend of ours. Aram? Yeah. Yeah. Aram. Yeah. Aram's a great guy. He's great. It's funny too. Love you, Aram. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Redefining Gains asks, why might SHBG be high as a natural and is this a bad thing? Ah, so SHBG can be high for a number of factors, um, some of them dietary related. So if you're on a very low carb diet, it can be quite high. So again, a lot of people fear carbs and a lot of people go all in on the high fat. A lot of guys, I would say, unless they're again, over 17 to 18% body fat can use more carbohydrates. A lot of them are just afraid of them. So that can be a factor. Also the environmental factors that disrupt all our hormones, the endocrine disrupting chemicals fucks with our hormones and that can increase it. And I think a lot of guys hyper fixate on trying to lower it through herbal remedies or other things. And I would say, don't hyper fixate on that. I would fixate more on if you have body fat to lose, get that down. If you have uh, a way to improve your consistency in lifting, sleeping, eating, all those things, focus on that first. Nice. Gotcha. Um, Personally, whenever I've had issues when I dieted really low, especially as a natural, I found that I think the best things for me, if I still wanted to keep my calories as low as possible, was honestly just, you know, focusing on fats, of course, and then bringing it up with all like omega threes and olive oil and yeah. avocados and things such as that. But uh, I think obviously, though, like if you still want to keep your calories low, at least for me, obviously, I stayed pretty damn flat because then I'd be increasing my fats, but still trying to keep my carbs low in order to cut. So yeah, there, I mean, there is a level, you know, obviously mm -hmm. people are cutting, but I think, um, like in my performance athletes, my BJJ athletes, like I will keep their protein on a high level, but lower. Mm -hmm. So maybe body weight, 
usually I'm, I'm higher with all my clients, but we'll, maybe we'll go body weight because I want to keep carbs as high as possible because that's going to drive energy and training. And the leaner somebody is, usually the better that they can tolerate carbohydrates. So I'll go pretty low with fats. And people freak out because they're like, oh my God, like I personally eat like 35, 40 grams of fat a day. And they're like, oh my God, your hormones. And I'm like, no, like I'm lean. I do well on carbs. So uh-huh. that helps drive my training, my performance. And fat, as you mentioned, if we get fish oil, if we get like the essentials in, we're going to do okay. You know, if you're sub 10 grams of fat, which sometimes people do for competing, I wouldn't stay there very long. (laughs) Oh, wait. Oh, man, that's crazy. (laughs) I wouldn't live that way. Um, I actually forgot to ask, but I was curious about like the mechanism around aromasin, like low estrogen and insulin sensitivity. So aromasin, like the drug? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, that is similar to like an astrazole. Mm-hmm. So usually people have done that letrozole, um, but the most commonly prescribed one is an astrazole. So how, how does that all relate to, to improving insulin or decreasing insulin sensitivity? I don't know. Fuck. Can we edit that out? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to not know. It's a good thing to say. I don't know. Cause sometimes. I can't, I can't even say the scientific mechanism, but it just tends to. I'm wondering if it's more related to just taking the aromasin or if it's more related to just simply like low estrogen. Uh, both. Because I actually, years ago, I took aromasin because I was like, oh, if I have estrogen, that's bad. I want to look really dry and hard. And literally catapulted myself into insulin resistance because literally started eating carbs. And then all of a sudden I was like uh, moody and then gaining body fat. And I was like, why am I gaining fat from regular like eating like how it was before it was bizarre Mm -hmm. and then someone brought this concept to my attention but i will learn to speak on the scientific method because i'm just so used to saying you need estrogen because it helps insulin sensitivity but now i'm like fuck i can't even articulate (laughs) no it's all good (laughs) like i just get curious about science but it's whatever we have google these days so this was good yes see um Japin your guts. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Jay pin your guts asks, how does one travel internationally with TRT? Ooh. Um, you have to look up the country of, of uh, that you're going into and see if you can bring them in. Because typically like traveling alone with TRT, they don't really pay attention to it. Like they think you're diabetic if you have needles and stuff. Um, if you have a prescription, you want to include that. But I know like countries like Australia, you can't cross the border with testosterone. They're going to be like, no. Okay. So yeah, I would look at what, like if that's allowed in the country you're going into. Konopaka asks, when on TRT, how to know what range is optimal? So the range that you feel best at is going to be one of the biggest reasons. So like I said earlier, subjective feedback versus also objective, looking at the labs and then also, you know, If your labs say your testosterone is 4,000, I don't think that you will necessarily feel amazing for what we're searching for, for a therapeutic dose. Um, But again, you don't want to be at a place where they hate anything above 1,000, where a lot of guys actually have to go above 1,000 in order to feel good. So symptom resolution is going to be a big part of that. So Mm -hmm. if somebody feels good and all of a sudden their mood is stable and all their other lab markers are good compared to where they were before, then I would say that would be the range. For most guys, I would say above five to 600 naturally is where they'll feel best. If they're on TRT, then that's going to be probably in the eight to 900 range. Oh, wow. Okay. That's kind of cool to hear that you've seen a difference in the average numbers for like best field from TRT versus natural. Yeah. But it's very, it's few and far between, but then you'll find more natural guys who have higher total levels of tests that still don't feel great. And Mm -hmm. that could either be due to their level of free testosterone due to their thyroid, poor lifestyle and stuff. But I've had like weird outliers of guys who were like 50 or 55 and they've had test levels of like 1280. And I'm like, this is bizarre or like 990. And I'm Mm. like, interesting because LH and FSH, like, you know, no signs of taking anything. So I'm like, this is very weird. And then I've also had people say like, I'm not on anything. And then their LH and FSH are zero. And I'm like, 
So how long have we been on time? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> they, don't, they think that you can't tell, but oh, there's ways to tell. I could read labs and be like, okay, <laughs> you're on uh, NPP or DECA. You're on this. We need testosterone. We need to lower body fat. Like, you know, you see enough of it over yeah. and over. How can you tell when, if it's someone's on MPP or DECA versus something um, else? They may, they, they may have high progesterone. They may have high inflammation. The lipids are going to be all over the place yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, with other things, if SHBG is very, very low, usually you know that's probably a DHT. Mm. Um, if somebody has inflammation, glucose, and insulin markers all over, then they probably have issues with insulin resistance and or they have a lot of body fat because a lot of body fat, fat is the most inflammatory tissue. Mm -hmm. So that's going to create an, an inflammation storm in the body too. Um, or, it, you know, they just don't know what they're eating because they'll, they'll always say the famous line, my diet's pretty good. I eat pretty clean. Cool. Let me see. And then, oh, I didn't even know I was eating that much fat. Like that's number one thing. It's like huge num number of fat, not as much protein as they should be. And then carbs are just like all over the place. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, Roman, Roman Atlas asks thoughts on HCG with enclomiphene. Uh, redundant for both. Um, HCG. So my buddy, I, I mentioned earlier, Dave Lee has done numerous courses and, and books on this. HCG is a female pregnancy hormone that men are not deficient in. So mm -hmm. that's something to take into account. Not every guy feels good on it. However, it is something that is used to maintain testicular hypertrophy, which we alluded to earlier, not necessarily a thing that women care about so much as guys. And I totally get it. They care about having, you know, the fullness and stuff like that. Um, but I think that it, it is overprescribed in the sense that, well, you're, if you're going on testosterone, you have to be on, on HCG. If fertility is something of concern, then that might be an option as something to add on. It might not have to be year round. There are also other things like you could use actual FSH or HMG if you need like the big guns of fertility to come into play. A compounding pharmacy can absolutely make those. Yeah. Clomiphene and enclomiphene, again, those are marketed now as keeping your natural production. However, similar guys don't always feel the best on that. And quite frankly, if a guy needs testosterone, why are we creating all these alternate routes to increase testosterone where he actually needs testosterone? If like a diabetic needs insulin, you're not going to say, well, here, eat this mass amount of protein to get this little bump in, uh, you know, insulin production. How about we just give insulin, Right. So similar with testosterone, if a guy needs testosterone, why aren't we giving him testosterone or why are people fearing it? And I think because those are orals that it's just a little bit easier for them to digest the fact that like, oh, I'm not injecting. I think one of the biggest things is that some people just are too scared to commit. Um, and yeah. I think the the marketing around ATG and enclomiphene is like you can take this for some time and hopefully it'll continue to boost your testosterone at least higher than it was before. I know from my knowledge, it'll boost it a lot higher during the process yep. and it'll obviously decrease afterwards. But I think there's just like a hope that maybe like, you know, Oh yeah. I've had like guys steps. in their forties come to me. They've been on, um, in clomiphene for like years and they're like, I don't feel good as when I started. I'm like, I know you're 49. Like, why are we on, you know, Clomid? Mm -hmm. And it's because they were scared of TRT or they didn't want to inject. And, you know, I had to explain to them that like the fears that they had were the heart attack and the cancer. And I had to explain to them um, the modern research and how things really work. And I was like, there's a shit ton of literature on, you know, Clomid being not so great too. And so then they changed to TRT and it's like night and day mm -hmm. difference. Is there a, what, what is the potential probability of someone's testosterone being permanently higher after they do HCG and clomiphene? I don't know percentage, you know. but I don't, I don't think crazy high. I, I've never seen it get to levels like I, I've seen in the 900s, but I've never seen to where somebody's had it stay there for a long period. But then again, if they come to me on that, then I do my, my best to convince them of, transitioning to TRT. 
like you need testosterone. Your labs before clomiphene literally, literally are screaming testosterone. Why aren't we on that? And then that discussion ends up in the transition. Gotcha. I see. Okay. Cool. It is kind of interesting because it's a... Uh it's shown to be like, you know, it's promoted as this way for people to like naturally boost their testosterone back to good levels. But I do see more often than not, it's mostly just during the period of it take, being taken. So I think that's like a, a little misunderstanding. Uh, yeah. And that's like, it upsets me. It's marketed that way to guys. Mm -hmm. There's companies online that only do that. That's mm -hmm. the only therapy they use is Clomid monotherapy. I will say if you want bigger loads, though, the HCG is fucking nice for sure. Yes, that will help with that for sure. I have yes. a, I have a for the guys that, that asked about that, yes. <laughs> I do have a friend that was on a cycle and obviously he had no intent to, but he took HCG during it and accidentally got a girl pregnant. So, um, you know, HCG is powerful. It is. It does help. Um. Wesley G asks, is pinning underground testosterone going to be that detrimental to my health? <laughs> it depends what's in it. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. Um, yeah, it, I mean, where it comes from, what is it? Like, it, the dosages are usually not accurate. So that's a loaded question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it really definitely depends where you get it from. So, I mean... I would always, I always personally just recommend to everybody, man, just like go to, I know it's a lot more expensive, but it's, you're putting this in your body. Not only are you like consuming it, but you're injecting it straight to the bloodstream. Not that there's very much of a difference. It's still going in your body regardless. But I personally think that anything that I think at least goes in my body, I want to make sure that I, uh, I trust it full heartedly. Yeah. So, which is hard. It's hard with UGL stuff. It is because everyone says, oh, mm -hmm. I have a guy and it's a good source. And it's like, well, you don't really know where it comes from. Right. I do though think though, if you actually have a personal friend like that has been doing it for years, like that's going to be way better than you going like to some fucking website online or something. Yeah. Like don't, I recommend don't do that for sure. Correct. And I would not recommend that as using that as your TRT. And I have had guys doing underground at like 300 milligrams. And then I'm like, cool, let's do this correctly. Let's get you with somebody competent. And their prescription dose ends up being a little bit less, but they feel better because mm -hmm. it actually equated or what they were taking was underdosed. Mm -hmm. But it could go either way. Do you happen to have any opinions on like peptides? So I used to get like really into them. Like I want to say 2010, 11, around then where they were a lot easier to get online. I was like, oh, this does this. This does it. Let me try all of them. So I tried like all the GHRPs and like the hunger and that was just like unbearable. And I'm <laughs> like, why am I doing this? I literally would mm -hmm. stare at the ceiling. Um, I tried all the, the fat loss one. I, nothing ever really did anything for me except for BPC. That helped ah. with tissue uh, yeah. issues and stuff like that. And a lot of places will market them to guys and stuff like that. But it, it's, it's kind of like a supplement where there's something that does something for every ailment or issue that somebody could have. So you want to get tan here, here's a peptide. You want to lose fat, here's a peptide. You want to sleep, you want to do this, you want to do that. So literally people would be able to find one that does something. Me personally trying them, I hate having to keep up with all the injections. Like that was the most annoying part. And mm -hmm. I travel a lot as an adult now. And the thought of having to refrigerate constantly and deal with that, I was just like, I, I didn't bother. So there's none that I take personally now mm -hmm. just due to that. And that I personally really don't think a lot of them do what they are marketed to do. I do fucking love BPC though. Yeah. I feel like BPC has been saving my life, honestly, because uh, again, in my Prometheus DNA results, which makes all the sense <laughs> in the world, I was wondering why the fuck do I feel like more fragile than other people? Like that makes like, am I just a pussy or what? <laughs> uh, I have like, I have like fucking... I have so many genetic genetic predispositions for various types of tendonitis. Interesting. A lot, yeah. And um, it said it's more, it's more, it's got a little higher percentage rate of chance in Asians. There's some things that I have, obviously, that a higher rate of chance in Asians, such as like carb sensitivity, um, the muscle, um, type one fiber. Uh, but this is another one, and man, I've been having fucking like hand at tendonitis issues joint issues for like my entire life no shit yeah shoulder impingement on both places that's a little bit less related to ten, to, to tendonitis but like right now literally i have decurvain's ten, tendonitis that literally occurred 
a month ago in my right hand and like two weeks ago in my left hand. And now it's just on both hands and it fucking hurts and I can hardly like lift right now. And I didn't really do anything crazy. It just started occurring. So it's another yeah. thing where I'm like, don't compare yourself to other people. Don't compare your test levels to other people. You have no clue what your genetic predispositions are. You could be anything. So yeah, everyone really is unique, you know, even with food and training and stuff. Yeah. And that's why blanket cookie cutter things don't really don't always work. work. No. no. <laughs> and it will work for some, but it doesn't work for all. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for coming on this podcast. That's it. We're done. That yeah. was like two seconds. <laughs> <It's> two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for having me. Honestly, it, it was an honor. And I mm -hmm. really love talking about <laughs> this stuff. And, you know, I, I hope men feel more compelled to be able to take action on their health and they feel empowered to follow through with it. And honestly, if anyone's scared or has questions, they can DM me. Mm -hmm. It's so. funny because I've had a lot of podcasts recently that I think have scared people away from anabolics. But on the other hand, I think there's a lot of podcasts I've had, such as this one, that show so, so many benefits of doing TRT, especially if you don't feel great right now. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's the best reason. I mean, honestly, in the end, right? Well, it's not yeah. what the number is. It's how you feel. 100%. And so. it's differentiating it from like, you know, yes, it's a stero steroid hormone. However, it's not like steroids. So TRT doses are different than... Uh, bodybuilder dose extremely different so yeah guys yeah. i think need to uh understand that and have the proper education on that and how it can be life-changing for them and they won't suffer some of the consequences that bodybuilders might at very high doses they may feel amazing and just not know it so i have one next question i ask everybody at the end of every podcast uh if you were to die tomorrow and you had one message you could send to the entire world what would it be to be kind um and that you don't know what's going on in someone's life before passing judgment. I think it, that's been a big concept is that I think we're very quick to be like, what a dick or, you know, I can't believe they did that. And just having some compassion and empathy for life being hard these days. And not everybody knows what you're enduring or have endured. And that would be it to have that. I love that. I love that. Because uh, I, I stand by something and that's reacting minimally, but responding with love. Because my reaction, my default reaction uh, is always different, you know? Yeah. The anger is always there subconsciously, but if I can actively, consciously, and mindfully respond in, in a different way, then I would love to. 100%. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you Thank for this. Thank you, dude. Yeah, where can everybody find you? Um, at the Ali Gilbert, A-L-I, on Instagram. That is pretty much where I am most active, so... You guys can slide in the DMs and I run a men's health event in November called the Silverback Summit, silverbacksummit.com. You'll find all the info on there. Basically blends my world of TRT, fitness, nutrition, ED, and business for men in one room. Oh yeah. Yeah. So Yeah, slide in her DM, send her another dick pic. <laughs> I was just telling him I got my fourth ever. And and like the context with it is do I need TRT? And then they send that photo. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, I've gotten a video asking that. I've gotten photos and it's like, do I, you know, is my erection okay? And then I say, oh my God, you need a urologist. And then I block them. <laughs> <laughs> Savage. Awesome. Well, everybody, um, you've heard this before, but if you'd like to support the podcast, you can by rating us a five star on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you find a podcast, and by subscribing to the YouTube channel, because that's what helps us get better, bigger and better, greater, greater guests like we have today. So thanks, Ali, for coming on again. Thank that was you. pretty awesome. That was fun. See you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>